Welcome to another episode of Off the Plugin Chain. I'm your host, Dr. Tom, and this video is going to be about how you can use different instrument articulations so that your music sounds more realistic, more interesting, and more musical. So what I'm going to do is we're going to look at some examples. I'm going to pull up Studio One here, and it has this little routine it has to go through. It doesn't take long. Okay, so this is an example that I used in my last video, but that one I, I talked a lot and then it wasn't until the very end of the video that I got to this. So I wanted to uh, present something here where I got a little bit uh, to the point quicker and illustrate um, this in a way so that if you wanted to refer to some information about how to use key switch presets in Studio One, uh, you'd probably be better suited to watch this one instead of the last one I did. All right, so let's take a look at this. If if we go to, um, if I open up contact here, here we go. This is an instrument from Spitfire Audio's Symphonic Strings Library. Okay, and right now it's set on um, the articulation is called long. Over here you can see what, what it's named and then each one of these here is a different articulation that you can select. Here's the instrument range. Okay, that all makes sense. So this is the first violin section of uh, the symphonic strings library. All right, so these button or these arrows here enable you to toggle up and down by octave and so if we do that if we keep going down you'll get to um, this octave here and this is actually C minus 2 so C minus 2 falls outside of the range of an 88 key uh, keyboard or piano so if we were to take this uh, controller I have here okay and let's see Maybe it's easier. Um, there we go. Okay. So on a controller like this, you usually have buttons here that enable you to toggle up and down by octave. And so this is actually the down key. This is the up key. So if you want to go up an octave, then you would press this button. And then if you wanted to go back down to where you started, you would click the, the down button. So it enables you to um, extend the the uh, uh, limitations of having a smaller uh, controller sometimes. This is uh, a 37 key uh, controller. So, you know, I, I, I like to play on a, a piano, obviously, or 88 key synthesizer or, or instrument, but sometimes um, having a keyboard this size is good if uh, you need something portable or if uh, you know, you, you just, um, you're only playing in a certain range, so then um, you don't need as many keys, perhaps. But anyway, so you can use uh, your controller, and you can use the, uh, uh, the octave up and down keys so that you can go, go down and then get to the, the C minus 2 range, which is what we have here, the, the, um, uh, Spitfire libraries, they've come up with uh, basically a protocol for, for their libraries at least, and their key um, switches, the keys that change articulation, they generally start at C minus 2. So here you got C minus 2, C sharp minus 2, D minus 2, all the way up to G sharp minus 2. And when you click each one of these, then it, it makes one of the uh, corresponding articulations um, that are pictured here, they become active. Um, and what you need to do when you're playing like that is you have to click the, the key switch first before you can generate a tone that reflects the new articulation. So you could almost do it in time, but still the key switch has to be pressed first. All right, well, um, using key switches like this isn't isn't too bad 
Um, I think it's probably easier if you're going to play on the fly, if your key switches were um, the key switch notes, if they fell within the range of a, of a standard 88 key keyboard, you could tuck them down at the very end in the low bass that uh, you typically don't use very often. Um, some developers, they put them into high frequency octaves. If you were sitting on a piano keyboard, that would be um, on the right side of the keyboard. You know, upwards of C5, F5, F6 um, octaves uh, that extend uh, higher, higher in the treble range, because um, a lot of uh, instruments that are within the mid range, uh, um, their their ranges don't extend into that low bass or that the high treble. So those those keys could be used for key switches. So. If you had an 88 key keyboard and the key switches fell within that range, then you could play on the fly. If you had something again, like like this 37 key keyboard, well, that's going to be a lot different. So what can you do there? Well, you could toggle up and down in the octaves like I was demonstrating there, or you could get something like this uh, uh, nano, what's this called? I always forget, nano key two. Uh, controller and this has two octaves it's only 25 keys I, I don't think it's really practical for playing much on this although you can you can use this as a as a MIDI controller that's what it is uh, here we go um, and so you, you could use that as a MIDI controller definitely what I've opted to do is I put stickers on the different octave notes okay and so down here is C minus two then C minus one and then C zero and so what I've been able to do is map those articulation um, keys to these uh, little controllers I've got two of them one for the the low octave range ones like C minus two and then I've got another one over here that starts being mapped at F6 um, for different libraries all right, so those are all ways that you could, uh, as you're playing or performing, playing your, your MIDI controller, these are ways that you can change the articulations as you're playing on the fly. Uh, having um, this type of setup, whether you're uh, using the key switches uh, on the MIDI controller or you got separate ones, like I, I demonstrated with the Nano Key 2 controllers, uh, what you're going to end up having to do at some point as you're um, moving through different articulations is that if the key switch is on your left side because it's in the low bass range, um, then you're going to have to take your left hand, you're going to press that key, and then you could keep playing with the right hand, but you're going to have to do something where you're jockeying back and forth. Uh, same goes for the, the high octave. Uh, uh, key switches I was just talking about too. In that case, then you could continue to play with your left hand, but then you got to reach over with your right hand. It's also possible that you could uh, conceivably map all your high and low ones to the same controller, maybe not like this one, but um, in a video I saw by a guy named Guy Mitchell Moore, just incredible. Incredible um, media composer based in uh, out of London, I believe it is. Um, he demonstrated in some of his videos. He uses a device. I think it's called an Akai Mini MPC or Akai MPC Mini, one or the other. But um, he uses that to uh, jockey back and forth through his uh, through the uh, key switches. So. Um, you could learn more about that if you check out his videos too. Uh, all right, so anyway, so these are ways that you can get the uh, articulations to change as you're playing. So what happens once you get the uh, the notes into your DAW? Okay, and that's that's what I have here. I recorded this little tune up on the top, and I assigned this to the first violins from the Symphonic Strings Library, and this is a um, I think they call these just instruments, and so you have sample libraries with, with various instruments, and then within the instruments you can have 
single articulations where it can only play one type of articulation. Um, for instance, this one is set on long, so if it was a single articulation uh, instrument, then you could only play long with it. Then there might be a, a second one that's dedicated to concertino, and then staccato, spiccato, pizzicato, all the rest. If you do that, then what you end up having to do is you have to uh, create a new instrument track for each different articulation. And this is actually um, quite common that you see this. Um, and, and I think it's, it just depends on what your workflow needs are for a particular project that you're working on, whether you opt to use separate tracks for articulations, or what I'm going to suggest here is that uh, if your computer has enough uh, RAM, um, that maybe what you want to do is use a multi-articulation instrument. So this one has nine different possible articulations that you could trigger from it. Okay, so if you were to do this and you, you kind of did a survey of the articulations that are available on it, and you said, hey, you know, I could probably do most of my string writing with these articulations. I'm not really missing anything. Well, then you could go ahead and load this in, and instead of having to um, create nine separate tracks, you would only have one. All right, so I think that's kind of an advantage, and this is kind of a workflow approach that I'm working on, and I, I want to advocate for people because I think it's kind of crazy to expect that we're all going to be using these enormous uh, templates with hundreds of tracks or thousands of tracks. If that works for you and you've got the computer set up to handle all of that, so be it. So. Have fun with that. What I'm advocating here is something I think for most hobby level uh, or uh, folks that are just getting into this uh, DAW development um, uh, or a MIDI um, orchestration type of workflow, um, especially if you're familiar with music notation. So uh, here's the MIDI tune and then uh, here we've got the, the notes, uh, this is the piano roll, and then here you've got the note velocities and you can, you can edit these, you can click on it, you can make them shorter or you can make them longer. The longer they are, as they extend closer to the, the top of the range here, they get louder. As you uh, make the, the lines shorter here, it decreases the velocity. And velocity is basically uh, the, the instrument amplitude, so it's, it's how loud um, it's going to sound. And then down here, you've got the key switch area. Okay. And so, um, these are mapped to these notes here. So this first one long, um, if you were using a keyboard, you would click this, this, uh, C minus two, and then it would advocate or, uh, activate, uh, the long articulation. Then if you wanted to go to spiccato, uh, I believe that's, uh, it's one of these here. I'm not going to mess with it right now, but you would click it first and then you would be able to uh, play in spiccato. So one thing you'll notice here is that if you were to draw a straight line from the edge of this long all the way up to the top, that the articulation is um, assigned first and then the note comes after it. So the articulation is actually to the left of the note. All right, so these are all played as longs. Okay, da -da, that's done. And then um, the next group of notes is going to be spiccato, so you can see that um, where the spiccato starts, if you were to draw a line straight up, that's going to be left to the note. So you always have to activate the key switch uh, or the, the articulation change before you play. So this just does it this way, and um, I think it's, it's just uh, it's a nice way to keep in track of what you're doing, make sure that it's always to the left. Now, what you'll also see here is that I extended this all the way across. Um, and the reason I did that was just so I could easily see, okay, these are all being played as longs. Because really, all you need to do is you could just make a little square here. You don't have to make it this long rectangle. And if you just um, stop at this small square here, this is all going to be um, empty. And then you'll have this spiccato here, and if that was a, a little yellow square instead of a long rectangle, um, it would just play the longs, 
until it got to the next yellow square and then it would play all those as spiccato and then if you had a little tiny green square here instead of a long rectangle then it's pizzicato until you get to the next one so that's kind of how that works and uh but i think um f just for now i'm preferring doing it this way so i know exactly uh which which articulation is matching with what note okay so um Without any further ado, uh, I just want to play through this um, one more time, and then uh, I think that's going to do it for, for this video. So let's go to the transport control. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this, and let's make sure we're, we're back at the beginning. Okay, and so here we go. All right, so not too shabby. Uh, there's other things you'd probably want to do um, if you were um, really working this, um, uh, working on this as some type of piece that you're or project that you're in the middle of. You might want to change some of those velocities. Some of the notes, maybe um, you want to nudge them uh, a little ways this way or that. Um, I think for, for purposes of this uh, example, it's pretty good. Now, one thing though, if you were playing for uh, real performers, then um, you have to be mindful of how much time, based on the tempo that you're playing, the performer needs to be able to flip back and forth between pizzicato, where you pluck the string, versus um, any type of arco or, or sustain, uh, anything where you're not plucking the string basically um, you, you need to be able to have enough time to go back and forth um, to do that at slower tempos maybe a, a, a beat is enough or even a an, an eighth note but um, at faster tempos you're going to have to give the performers more time or you're going to have to split up your writing so that as one section ends the sustains another one will play the pizzicatos so anyway those are things that it's good to keep in mind um, we can do all kinds of neat things with computers um, and with DAWs but um, I think there's it's still important to try to emulate what a true orchestra would do what an actual performer would do and when you do that then I think this uh, stuff we do um, digital audio music becomes more like art so all right with that um, I think that's all I'm going to talk about so like I said I was going to try to make them these videos a little shorter now so everybody be safe and stay creative